after Jesus washed the disciples' feet. It says he cleaned himself up, put his robe back on, and then he gathered them around the table. They had eaten, but there was still stuff on the table, and he took one of the loaves of bread, and he lifted it up, and he gave thanks for it. And then he broke it. And it was in the breaking that he said, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat of it. And then in the same way, it says that he, he took the cup that was there. Again, he lifted it up, gave thanks, blessed it. And he said something significant. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant. This is my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Again, take, drink of it. At Grace, these are words we say to each other every single week. Because they're words that matter. They're words that we need to be reminded of. But the truth is, I mean, just like anything you do in life, it's easy when you say the same thing over and over and over to get into a rut and you don't actually think about what is being said. It's easy to miss the significance and the power of the words. My body for you. My blood for you for you, for the forgiveness of your sins. He says, this is a new covenant. These are all phrases we could talk about, but it's that last one that I want to talk about. New covenant. See, the reason I want to talk about it is because it's probably the one that we don't understand the most, and I'm going to argue it's probably the most significant thing that Jesus says in that entire meal. What he does when he says, this is the new covenant, he's saying Everything from this point forward is changing. Nothing is the same. Everything's different. Everything is on the chopping block. We're not going to do things the old way. We're going a whole new direction here. And his boys probably didn't understand a word he was saying at the moment. I think this is one of those things when Jesus was resurrected, he had to go, okay, boys, let me explain this to you one more time. I know you weren't in there in the moment and the whole thing, but let me explain this to you. Because here's the thing. We're not going to do things the old way. Well, you have to go, well, what is the old way? Right? In order to understand the new covenant, we need to understand the old covenant. Well, the old covenant comes to us from Moses. And in fact, if you remember when we took the time last year to work our way through the whole story of the Bible, when we get to Moses, something significant happens. By God's grace, he rescues Israel out of Egypt. He takes them not because of anything they ever did to deserve it, but solely out of his goodness towards them. His grace. He rescues them, and then he brings them to Mount Sinai, and he goes, okay, covenant time, boys. And girls, because all of Israel was there too. Covenant time, folks. And he goes, here's what's going to happen. I just rescued you from all this baggage, from all this junk. We're in a new relationship. There's nothing hindering us here, Israel. Here's how you stay in the relationship. Here's the covenant. And then Moses proceeds to give the law. First you have the Ten Commandments, and then you end up with something like 613 laws that Moses begins to unfold. And the whole point of this covenant was this is how you stay in good relationship with God. It's based on what you do. The way you keep your faith, the way you make yourself righteous, the way you stand in God's good graces, the way you continue to be in relationship with him is solely dependent upon you. And then the law makes amends because it recognizes you're going to mess up. And so there's this whole sacrifice system. So here's the law. This is what you're to do. And then when you mess up in the law, don't worry, we've got a means to fix it so you can get back into the law. That's the old way of doing it. And Jesus goes, we're not going to do that anymore. In fact, it's Jesus going, you know what? The whole Old Testament, the whole old law, the whole old covenant, fulfilled. Don't worry about it. Set it aside. Close the Ten Commandments. Close the 600 laws. It's done. Because here's the thing. This new way, it's not like the old. In the old way, your righteousness was dependent upon you. The new way, 
is not dependent upon you. It has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with what I am doing for you. See, what Jesus does in this meal when he takes this new covenant idea is he's basically going, you couldn't do it. That's okay. Just read the Old Testament. You realize, yeah, humanity is terrible at keeping the Old Covenant. We're terrible at keeping and following laws. We are natural lawbreakers. We love to make ourselves God. We love to elevate ourselves and decide what is right and wrong. And Jesus goes, yeah, we're just not going to do that anymore. New way. I'm going to do it for you. My body, my blood, for you. Whole new order here, folks. Now, I want to be very clear on this because this is huge. What he's doing is radical. And what he does is the true fundamental crux of Christianity. More than anything else, Christianity is not about what you do at all. It is solely about what Jesus has done for us. Look, I want to be very clear, and I'm going to push this. Christianity is not about following the law, even the Ten Commandments. I know this is where I'm pushing you. I want you to hear this. That's the old covenant, the fundamental basis of our faith that Jesus reveals in the new covenant language. It's not about the law because you couldn't keep it. It's about how he kept it for you, what he did for you. And it's about receiving that. See, this is the fundamental shift. And in fact, the thing that sets Christianity apart from literally every other world religion, every other world religion is about what you contribute, what you do how you earn good favor, how you earn good status through your deeds, through your works, through your actions, how you appease or please the gods or the cosmic forces in the universe. Every other religion is this, not Christianity. We start from the premise of we could do nothing to please God. But God himself did it for us. This is radical. All we have to do is sit there and go, thank you. All we have to do is accept it. All we have to do is go, yeah, and stop trying. Church, this is radical, radical. When Jesus says, new covenant, that's what he's getting at. We're not doing the law thing anymore. I'm doing it for you. But he doesn't stop there. Because then Jesus, we're told, immediately takes the bread. He moves after instituting, dips it, and he gives a piece to Judas. Now, this is totally reading into the text, so I'm throwing that out there. <laughs> but you can get the sense that this is Judas' breaking point. When Jesus is talking about this new covenant idea, Judas doesn't want that. Judas wants the old ways. In fact, most of the Jews want the old ways. This is what sends Judas over. That's totally me reading into it, but that's what I see. But at a minimum, what you know is after this meal, Jesus dips the bread, hands it to Judas, and he looks at him and says, go do what you got to do, but do it quickly. Judas then gets up and leaves. As Judas leaves, Jesus turns to the remaining 11, and he goes, guys, I don't have much time with you. We're running out of time. And I know some of you are thinking, Jesus, you just did away with my whole system. At which we go, no, they probably weren't thinking that, okay? They weren't there. But he's thinking, you're probably wondering, because if Jesus has just taken away their whole law system, their whole morality, their whole legal code, their whole way of living, they're kind of left aimless. So what do we do? If you've done it all for us, what do we, does this mean we can do whatever we want? And Jesus goes, no, I'll tell you what you're going to do. You're going to respond to what I've done for you. That's it. New command. New command I give you. You're going to love one another. That's it. That's it. You want to know what Christianity is all about? You want to know what this following Jesus thing is all about? You want to know what this new covenant is and how it's different from the old covenant? 
Just respond in love. In fact, that's what he says. Love one another specifically as I have loved you. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. That's it. Look, this is radical. And I will tell you, I don't know when we became so complicated as a church that we took Christianity and made it into these theological maxims that somehow you have to embrace if you want to be truly a Christian, if you want to understand it. That's not what Jesus is saying. The thing that makes Maundy Thursday so radical, so significant, is Jesus takes this complex religious system that we like to make up, and he goes, it's done. I'm fulfilling the old complex system. We're done with that. All you got to do is love. That's Christianity. Love as I have loved you. This is radical. Radical. As I have loved you. And in that is already implied, because I know some of you are going, see, that's a works element. See, that's how you're saved, is you actually have to go do something. You have to go and do and love. But actually, if you listen to what he says, that's not true. Because in the words is this implicit fundamental premise of because I have already loved you. Because you're already saved. See, doing things isn't about improving your standing with God. Doing things isn't about getting right with God. God got you right with him. When you received his love, you're good. This is, well, now that I've received it, what do I do with it? And Jesus just goes, it's real simple. Do what I did. Love like me. As a church for Lent this season, I'm really glad, I really enjoyed the the sermon series that Pastor Chris chose. It was this whole Go and Do Likewise series. And specifically for five or six weeks, we've been looking at how did Jesus love people? How did Jesus love people? And so he chose a bunch of, and I like that he did this, a bunch of obscure stories out of the Gospels, and just said, what do we learn about the way Jesus loved people from these stories? And I will tell you, as I reflected on it, I think there's two significant lessons we can learn about how Jesus loved. And these are important because if the only thing we're called to do is love like Jesus, we should probably learn these two things. First is this. Jesus consistently throughout the Gospels sees people, and you go, Really, that's your great revelation. He sees people. I got eyes. I see people. But see, here's the thing. He didn't just see people for their condition or their superficial appearance in some way, shape, or form. He didn't see them as their gender. He didn't see them as their race. He didn't see them as their socioeconomic status or their physical ailments or their condition or whatever other thing that you and I have a tendency to view and categorize people into. He saw people as people. He saw them as people with hurts, with desires, with hopes, with needs, with wants, with love, need of love. He saw them for who they really were deep down when you strip away the superficiality. That's huge. He saw them as people. And then second, because he saw them as people, he was always moved out of compassion to act. See, when Jesus looked at a person, he saw through the facade And he saw the true need. And when he understood the true need, he moved himself out of compassion to try and meet that need. The thing that sets Jesus apart, though, is he often did it at his own expense. Sometime at his own ritual purity expense. Often at his reputation, at expense of his reputation. And his own physical comfort. He sacrificed all of it out of compassion for other people, for the betterment of other people. Guys, this is what Christianity is all about. This is what Jesus calls us to, to love as he loved us. He saw you, he saw your need, and he was moved out of compassion. Now, this whole foot washing thing, you go, what's up with that? Why do you do that? His last final act before the cross, what's up with the foot washing thing? It is kind of a weird thing, right? It is weird. And then he stands up and he goes, hey, you're right to call me teacher. You're right to call me Lord, for that is what I am. But I want you to know something. You don't get what I just did. He fully says this. You don't understand it. But what I want you to understand is no servant is better than their master. And if it was not beneath me 
to wash your feet. It's not beneath you. You are not better than me. Anything I did, you are to go and do just like I did. And so here's the thing about foot washing. It's absolutely disgusting. Okay? In our day and age, it's quite gross. Right? The ladies that are doing pedicures, God bless them. I don't let them near my nasty feet. But in that day and age, you got to remember, everybody wore sandals, first of all. They didn't have paved roads. They didn't have indoor plumbing. And they didn't have automobiles on the road. But they had to get around somehow. So you can imagine the filth that these people walk through. So when Jesus bends to wash his disciples' feet, it's understandable that Peter throws a fit. And he goes, no, 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 no. That's slave work. You can't do slave work, Jesus. And Jesus rebukes him for the first time tonight. Rebukes him. He goes, no, I'm going to wash all of you. And then I'm going to wash your feet. And then Peter, overzealous, well then give me a bath, Jesus. <laughs> Head to toe, let's do this, sucker. Jesus goes, you don't need that. But the whole point of the foot washing is to again model for you how Jesus loved you. Nothing was beneath him. The most disgusting job he was willing to do for the betterment of others. This is the gospel. It's not about what you do. You are not saved. You are not judged. Your merit is not determined by your actions at all. And thank God for that. The only thing that matters is what Jesus has already done for you. All you have to do is say, thank you. And when you receive truly what it is that Jesus has done for you, you respond in love as he loved you. That's it. And I'll tell you, when you understand that's what tonight is all about, you realize, oh, this makes sense that we celebrate this thing every year. Because we like to mess up Christianity into some complex system. It's so not, guys. This is why he came. This is what he did. Tonight, we're going to receive communion a little differently than normal. As you can see, we have two tables set up in the front. And the main reason for this is because, as we said at the very beginning, it's easy to kind of get into a rut. It's easy to get into a habit. And when you get into these habits, to kind of forget or miss the significance of what's being said. So we figured, hey, let's just try and mix things up a little bit. So to the very best of our ability, I have recreated a first century Passover meal. And you go, I don't want to go to the Passover meal. I'd be starving at the end of this. Well, I skimped on the brisket tonight, okay? I skimped on the brisket. But maybe next year, Brian, you want to get in on that with me? Make some brisket? We could do that. That would be, be quite nice. And what we're going to do is this. We're going to have two servers at each station. Brian and I will be over here. And then uh, Marlon and Drew are going to be over here. And the ushers are going to dismiss you. And you're going to come and crowd around this table. And I mean crowd. Because here's the thing. I want you to get close. I want you to get snuggly. I want you to get up in somebody's business here. And don't worry if you smell. Odds are Jesus' disciples stunk because they lived in a day and age before deodorant, everybody. If you didn't know this. And Jesus is modeling how you are to love. So you can practice tonight loving the stinky person, okay? And if you are the stinky person, this is your first act of receiving grace and love from your brothers and sisters in Christ. <laughs> What's going to happen, though, is we're going to break the bread. We're going to do a mini institution in front of you to kind of get you this upfront glimpse of what that would have been like to have seated, been seated around the table with Jesus. Then someone's going to hand the bread, and you're going to just tear off a piece of it. My only words of instruction is this. Please grab the napkin thing when you go to grab the bread, if you feel the need to do that. Also, if you end up tearing off half of the loaf, um, let's try and share that, okay? Let's just try to share that thing. What's then going to happen is you're going to dip it in one of the two cups. The red is wine, and the clear is grape juice. We have the gluten-free option available at the table as well then I want you to just stay until at the very end, we're going to dismiss you with a blessing. And when we dismiss you with a blessing, I just want to encourage you to continue to go back and worship together. One final thing. This is a table that, yes, I set up in some way, but it's not done by me. This is a table that Jesus set up. I'm just mimicking it. 
And the truth is, this is a table that's open to every single person in this room who longs to know Jesus, who longs to get out of this rut of the old covenant ways of thinking that it's about what you do and about what you offer and about what you bring to the table. And you're willing to go, I'm sick of that lifestyle. And you just want to freely receive what he has done for you. Allow his words as they are spoken to you to sink in to you. Allow them to speak afresh and anew to your heart. It's in that spirit, if you are hungry to know Jesus in that way, I invite you to come forward and receive this sacrifice.